So C.S. Lewis, he was, a, um, he was a college professor in Britain. He became a, a, pa a Christian. And he ended up writing a series of books, many books, but uh, among them were um, some books written on a place called Narnia. They were fantasy books. They were about four um, English youth that go to a, um, another land called Narnia. And in that land, Jesus is, comes in the form of a lion named Aslan. And the first book, these children go and they meet and they have an adventure, but then there was sequels. And in the second one, one of the children, whose name was Lucy, the first one to encounter Aslan, encounters, encounters him again in this second book. And when she does, she says, Aslan, you're bigger. And he said, no, that's just because you're older. And she says, well, isn't it because you're older? And he says, no, I'm not older. But every year that you grow, you'll see me as bigger. Now, this is a truth that C.S. Lewis had experienced in his own life, that every year he was a Christian, his vision of God and what he could do got bigger and bigger. Now, he could have just told that, but he found that telling it in the context of a story was much more effective in conveying the truths of God, especially to people who didn't believe in God. That if he put them in the, the truth of God in the context of a story, their defenses were down and they were more open to receive the truths of God. And so God also tells stories. And we're going to look at the beginning of one this morning. We're going to look at the book of Exodus. Now C.S. Lewis and other writers, when they tell stories, they do it with words. But God uses human history to tell his stories. So another way to say it, like a painter, um, they're going to use a canvas to paint them, or a, now we see people painting on a, a building. So they're they have a canvas or a place that they paint, but God's canvas is human reality. God tells his story in the context of the lives that we live. In other words, God influences events to direct them the way he wants them to go. And we see that in the book of Exodus. God's story is told in the context of what actually happened. Now, the story of Exodus is about, is about God and his people and so it's our story too, because we're also God's people. We are part of this story. And we're gonna to learn today how God provided for and responded to the needs of his people. And then we can see how he does the same for us today. Now let's just give a little context before we get into this story. So God, after the fall of Adam and Eve, God wanted to restore his relationship with humanity. That is his prime objective. Everything he does is directed to restoring his relationship with humanity. And it wasn't working out. So he said, I'm going to take one guy, one average dude, and I'm going to take him, and I'm going to do everything. And through him, I'm going to create a people that will belong to me, that their hearts will be mine. They'll They'll want to love me like I love them. So he took this guy, Abraham, and he made a bunch of promises to Abraham. He said, one, you're going to have more descendants. Look at the stars and the grains of sand. You'll have more descendants than that. He said, you're going to occupy this land, this good land, this land flowing with milk and honey. You're going to occupy that. Your people will it'll be their land. And he said, I'm going to be your God. So he made these great, wonderful promises to the people, and that's where we pick up in Exodus. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for calling us here this morning, that you have something to say to us. And Father, may it be your words that we hear. Father, we want to hear from you. We desire, whether we're conscious of it or not, we desire desperately to hear what you have to say. And we know that you want to speak. So we invite you here this morning to do that. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to read little chunks of Exodus as we go through this, and we'll start with Exodus 1, and we'll read verses 8 through 14. It says, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, 
They join our enemies and fight against us and escape the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. So the first thing we see in the book of Exodus is that God's people are enslaved. Now, God made these tremendous promises to Abraham, fantastic promises, and they're really not being fulfilled right now, right? I mean, yes, there's a lot of them. The people are multiplying, but they're enslaved. They don't possess a land, and God seems very distant and far away. So this slavery went on for 430 years. Where is God? I'm sure they were asking themselves. Now, how did this happen? Well, <clears throat> um, Abraham's descendants, his large family, in order to avoid famine, went down to Egypt where there was plenty of food. They're surprised when they get there that the, the um, relative of theirs, they thought dead, is actually second in command in Egypt. And so they settle there and they grow and they thrive. Um, but because of what we read, they, in some earlier history that we won't go into, the Egyptians were afraid of them and decided to enslave them rather than let them take advantage of them. Now the word exodus means a going out, <clears throat> a departure, usually of a large number of people. So the name of the book tells us the outcome. If you've never read the book, you know what the outcome will be. They're going to be set free. They're going to make an exodus from this situation. Now, why would God allow this? Why would God allow the people that he made a promise to to be enslaved for 430 years? Now. I'm just going to tell you this right up front. God does not feel the obligation to tell us the reason for everything he does. God's mind is his own. But I think we can surmise three good reasons that God would do this. The first is this, that God said they will occupy the land of Canaan. Right now there's other people living there. If he had simply taken Abraham's family, it's not going to happen. Because they're going to take it by natural yet supernatural means. In other words, if you've seen the latest Avengers movie, and I won't spoil it for you, but if you've seen the latest Avengers movie, at the end, what the bad guy does to the heroes, that's not how God's going to clear out the land, right? It's not going to be a magical supernatural thing. If there will be a supernatural power, God will be behind them, giving them victory. But the people themselves have to go in and take the land for themselves. In order to do that, they need a certain number of people. And so by spending this time in Egypt, their numbers grew to the point that they could go in and occupy, and once they had it, protect and hold the land. So God allowed them to build up their numbers so they could fulfill the promise he made for them. The second thing is it became an opportunity for God to show his power. God wanted to show them that he's not just a God who talks, he's a God who acts. And they're right now in, in a land that had many gods, false gods, demonic gods, and God's going to prove that he is greater than any of them, as we'll see in the weeks ahead as we study this book. So God's going to show them, your God is the mightiest of all. He wants the people to know who their God is and what he's like and the power that he has. And I think the third thing is this. The third reason he allowed his people to be enslaved for 430 years is because God is merciful. And if we were to go back to Genesis, when God is making these promises to Abraham, he tells him something very important. We'll read it in, in Genesis 15. Genesis 15, 12 through 16, God is talking to Abraham about his promises. He's making a covenant with Abraham. And he says, now this, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. As for you, 
You shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they will return here. For the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. So the people that occupied the land God said he would give to them were the Amorites. And God is saying here, long before that ever happened, I can't give you your people the land yet because the Amorites, who are an evil people, they're, I'm not going to drive them out until their sin has reached such a point. I, I have to do something. So he's saying, look, I don't want to do this, but these people, they're evil. They sacrifice their children to false gods. They sacrifice their babies. That's just some of the things they do. God has to deal with it. He can't let it go on. But he said, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait till their sin is so bad that they, there's, no, there's a point of no return. So God is being merciful. He's giving the people there a chance. And until their sin is full, he will not let his people go and occupy it. So God is being merciful to these people. Now, you yourself today might find yourself in some sort of enslavement, perhaps a medical condition or a financial situation. And God can use that for good. He can use it for a positive. Now, that's not God's ultimate intention for us. It's meant to be temporary. That's not God's final state for any of us to be enslaved to anything. And now, in the world today, every country in the world outlaws slavery, every country. And yet there's more slaves today than there have ever been. So from the 16th to the 19th century when America was involved in slavery, um, there was estimated there was, I think, 13 million slaves in that time. And today, a, a conservative estimate, there are 21 million slaves. That's a horrible thing. That shouldn't happen. Now there's way more people today than there were then too. That, I mean, I don't know if the percentage of people in slavery is bigger or not. Nevertheless, the number is greater than ever, even though um, it's been outlawed. Now why, why does that happen? It's because true slavery, and we're all born slaves, we are. We're born slaves to our sinful nature. We, we're all sinful, we, we cannot help it. We are bent towards sin, bent towards rebellion against God. The Bible tells us that the human heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now, we may not have enslaved anybody, but the truth is we're like, all like the Israelites, that we are sinful, and that we're so sinful, we don't think we're sinful. We think we're okay. Unless God were to come and reveal our heart to us, what we are really like, we think we're okay. In fact, we think we're pretty good because we're better than other people. So God sent, as we're gonna see, he's gonna uh, send somebody to save the people from their enslavement. He sent somebody for us too, but the slavery is our own heart, which betrays us, which will kill us if it's not addressed. The second thing that we see in this story is how do the people respond? And I just wanna share briefly, at the beginning of the story, so Pharaoh um, enslaved the people. He thought that would solve the problem, but they keep growing. There's tons of them. And so he says, to solve the problem, we're gonna kill all the male babies. But there's two Hebrew midwives, and when they get this decree to kill all the male babies, they don't do it. They're, why? Because they're more afraid of God than they are of Pharaoh. And so they lie. They say, well, these women are just, they're in such great shape that babies pop out before that we can get there. And Pharaoh said, okay, well, what can I do, right? But these women, and I, I say this because uh, God is for women, and I just want to make sure that that is conveyed. These are the heroes at the beginning of the story, two women, two ordinary women who out of fear of God stand up to the, the ruler of this nation that enslaves them, and they live in a, a, a country that is, you know, uh, filled by uh, patriarchy it is but yet God elevates women he believes women are are worthy and I think it's worth noting that these women are the two heroes that begin this story Shipra and Pua maybe one was Hawaiian Pua who knows could have been right so I just want to say that was part of the response to this was these two women stand up and do a very brave and bold thing but the second thing we want to see that people do is we'll read in Exodus 2 23 through 25 it says, during those many days, the king of Egypt died, 
And the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. So we see in Exodus the people's response to this enslavement is they cry out to God. Now that's appropriate and there's no shame in asking for help. So my secular job is I help brand new teachers. They're in the, our teacher program at UH, but they get hired early by the DOE because they need a job and they're basically hired to jo do a job they don't know how to do. And my job, my job literally is to help them. I don't grade them in any way. They provide me because we know it's difficult. And a lot of these people want to dig. They want to quit because it's hard. So they give me to help them. But they're reluctant sometimes to come to me because they're afraid if they, I, they tell me they're having a problem or they're struggling, it's going to be bad for them. Despite the fact that my job is to help them, they don't ask for help, some of them. And they learn eventually that they can and that they benefit from it. And we, all of us, in some way, in some capacity, need help. Do we cry out to God? Do we ask God for help? Why do we hesitate? God wants to help us. God wants to bless us. He wants to be involved in our lives and solve our problems. Why do we hesitate to ask for his help? And so often we do. And uh, our country, I don't know if you heard there's this thing going on about a Supreme Court um, judge. Did you hear about that? <laughs> Regardless of where you stand in this, and I'm certain in this room we have people on both sides, and that's okay. There is not one side that's right over the other, but it is dividing our country in many ways. And, and I think the only thing that can resolve that, heal that, is God. We have to cry out to God and ask for his help. And I'm going to ask us to do that right now, if you don't mind, if you just bow your heads for a moment. Father, our country is... Uh, divided over some very serious issues, but it needn't be. We can take a stand and we don't have to hate. We don't have to uh, attack the other side. We can still function and operate with integrity and, and uprightness. Help us to do that, Father, not to demonize those we disagree with, but to find common ground for the good of all of us, we pray. Bless our nation, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this won't be the last time that Israel cries for help. They're going on an adventure through this Exodus story, and they're going to cry out to God many times. And every time, God responds. God gives them what they ask for. He helps them. He gives them what they need. Now, we are told in the Bible that we should cast our cares upon him. Why? Because he cares about us. So if you have a need this morning, then don't hesitate to ask God. He wants to respond. And the last thing we're going to see in Exodus, people are enslaved, they crowd to God for help, so he sends a man to save them. Now God is the one saving them, but he's chosen to do it through this particular man. Let's read Exodus 2, 11 through 15. Now it came about in those days when Moses had grown up, then he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren, so he looked this way and that. And when he saw there was no one around, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. He went out the next day and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other. And he said to the offender, why are you striking your companion? But he said, who made you a prince or a judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and said, Surely the matter has become known. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Now Moses must have known that there was something special about him. He had to have heard the stories of how Pharaoh said, Throw all the male babies into the Nile. And how he was put into the Nile too, except he was put into a basket. And how he was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter who was bathing at that time and became her son. He, and, and he must have been told about how his sister followed him and offered to nurse the baby. And the, 
Pharaoh's daughter said, okay, and she said, I'll pay you for that. And so Moses' mother, who gave him up, ended up getting paid to nurse her own baby. He must have been told these stories. He knew that. He knew that it must have been for a reason. And so here he is. He's a child of slaves, living like a prince, educated, well-fed, getting all the benefit from the sweat of his people. He must have known that. And so he wanted to do something. He wanted to use his position. I'm sure he was certain God put him in that position to help his people. So he goes out and sees, how are they doing? And when he sees an evil overseer beating one of his brethren, what does he do? He saves his people. He kills that evil overseer, and he saves them from this man's torment further. Now, this is Moses seeing his calling from his perspective. Clearly, he could have known God did something special in his life. He had a special calling for him. And he said, this is how I'm going to fulfill it. I'm going to fulfill it by protecting my people to the degree that I can. So that's him fulfilling God's calling in his power. And it wasn't going to do much. Yeah, maybe he could eliminate an evil overseer or two, but it wasn't going to do much. In other words, his vision was small. He needed God's vision. God's vision was, I'm going to set those people free. Moses could never have imagined such a thing. And I'm going to use you to do it, Moses. We'll see how he responds to that in the weeks ahead. That was not Moses' vision at all. And if you're a Christian, God has called you and I. He has called us. And we try to fulfill it in our own power. And it's that, you know, you'll do some good. You probably will. But God has a greater vision, a greater intention. And, and it's in little things. So I'm sure I've told you before, but um, when my children were small many years ago, not that many, but <laughs> they're not that old yet, but I had a store in Kailua. And I felt as the man uh, responsible to support my family best I could, to make as much money as I could. And I kept my store open late. And my children were little when I got home, they had already eaten dinner, had a bath, and were in bed. And I wasn't happy about that, but I thought I had to. My calling as the, the head of my family is to make all the money I could. But I, I prayed, and God told me, close earlier. God told me that. I didn't think I could. I didn't think I should. I had to be responsible. And God said, no, close earlier. Close your store earlier. And so I I closed by 7. I used to close at night. I closed by 7. Now I could see them put to bed. Then I, God said, no, that's not enough. Closed by 6. Now I could be home for dinner. And it did not impact me significantly financially, but it had a huge impact on my family. That's God's vision for my role as a husband. My vision was, I got to make money, even if it means sacrificing relationship. But God said, no, that's not what you're called to do. You're called to be with your family. Yes, you have to work. He didn't tell me sit home and do nothing, right? Too bad, unfortunately. Nah. <laughs> right? I still worked. I still supported my family. But he had a better vision, a bigger vision of what my role was than, than I did. And I think that's to the benefit, hopefully, of my um, children who have yet to be arrested that I know of. Um, any? any uh, <laughs> don't like that look. But that was me trying to fulfill God's calling. God calls men to be husbands and fathers. And me fulfilling it in my understanding fell way short of what God's vision was. And I'm glad because I like my kids. I enjoyed spending time with them. I wanted to be home with them. And uh, we would eat dinner together every night. And when Kai got a little bit older, because would, we would sit on two corners of the table. And I don't know, when he's about... 11 or whatever, he starts attacking me under the table with his leg, right? He, just, he wants to wrestle with me at the dinner table. And so it just became a thing that we would leg wrestle at dinner. I mean, it's just stuff that kids do, right? Dads do with their sons. Mom and I did not leg wrestle. We did other things. But I mean, just things like that, such joy in that. Who know? I don't know what I got a lot out of it. I hope Kai did too. But I mean, little things like that couldn't happen if I wasn't there. I realize it seems like a nothing thing, but I think it's a huge thing. Certainly God regards it in that way. He's the one that told me to do that. 
And so God calls us. He calls us. Now, we can try to fulfill that calling in our own power, in our own vision. Like I said, we'll probably do some good. But if we do it in our strength, in our vision, it's going to fall far short of what God has called us to be. So we've got to seek God. God is the one that set us up just like Moses. We are not to try and fulfill that in our own power, but to God, tell me what to do. You've called me. How do I do it? What do I do? And if we do that, then it's the difference between freeing two guys from an evil overseer and setting a whole population free, right? It's the total difference between those two things. God wants to use us to set people free, to change this world, to bring his kingdom so everybody experiences it. Amen? Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for your calling on each one of us. We are, you set up Moses, Father. Now, we may not have the, as big a role as Moses, but you've given us a role, an important role for each one of us. You've positioned us to do your work. And Father, we cannot do it, cannot do it effectively without your help. Would you help us to understand what is our calling? And first, Father, if we have a family, it is as a husband or a wife, help us to fulfill that in the way that you, that you see that calling, Father. Because I know from my experience, Father, you had a much different vision of what it means for me to be a husband than what I did. Yours is much better. Um, so, Father, help us to fulfill those roles as husband, wife, father, or mother. But, Father, in our workplace, wherever we are, as a friend, as a leader in this church, as somebody who serves, Father, help us to understand how to fulfill that calling in your understanding that we may be as effective as possible and you may be given as much glory as possible. Thank you, Father. All this we ask in Jesus' name. And we're just going to pray one more time.